Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension, Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to do in today's video is go right back to the very first vehicle covered in the book, a mid-1890s horse-drawn buggy. And in terms of its suspension, I think you're in for a real surprise. So I live about 80 kilometres north of Canberra here in Australia, in a country area or a rural area. And uh, when I spread the word around that I was writing a book on uh, vehicle suspension and did anyone have any horse-drawn vehicles that I could analyse or test, a local person, Carolyn, invited me to her house to look at this particular horse-drawn buggy shown here pulled by Peggy the horse. Now, this buggy was built in Australia in the mid-1890s, 1894, 1895, around there. Uh, but it's very, very similar to American buggies of the, of the same period. And uh, as I said, a suspension is quite fascinating. You might not even be aware that vehicles of this sort had suspension, let alone how capable they were. So let's take a look. Now, first of all, let's look at the wheels, because the wheels are a really important part of the suspension design in this vehicle. They are lightweight, they are wooden spoked, and they have iron tires, so no pneumatic tires, and that's important for reasons I'll get to shortly. And the wheels are large. The front wheels are 1130 millimetres in diameter, 44 and a half inches, and the rear wheels are even larger, 1295 millimetres, 51 inches. Now, one reason the wheels at the front are smaller is to give better turning clearance because the front axle pivots at its middle and so the wheels come closer, the front wheels come closer to the buggy side, the body sides, as the uh, vehicle turns. And it doesn't have a very tight turning radius, but those smaller diameter front wheels give it a tighter turning radius than it would otherwise have. And one of the things that Carolyn showed me is when you want to get into the buggy, you always have the horse turned to one side and that actually creates a gap here that you can step through to be able to hop up onto the seat. So very large wheels, but still with iron tires, not pneumatic tires. Okay, now what about springs? Well, the buggy uses two very long half elliptic leaf springs down each side. So here they are, if you could look, you can see how long those steel leaf springs are, one each side supporting the bodywork. In fact, they are 1345 millimetres long, 53 inches long on this buggy. Front and rear shackles that allow elongation as the spring goes up and down. So there's those two springs, but in addition, there is a third. And this third spring, is transverse, sideways. It's a full elliptical spring at the rear. Now, this is a really intriguing buggy design because it adapts to multiple seating configurations. This thing here that looks just like a, a luggage boot or, or trunk or something like that actually is a fold-out seat. And here it is folded out. Now, notice these supports here and notice how the seat sits on those supports. The reason that's important is it's directly above this extra leaf spring. So in other words, this leaf spring really comes into operation to a greatest degree when you are carrying extra passengers at the back. It's a very, very tricky and interesting design. Now, another thing that you can see here, which we'll look at again in the next slide, is the front and rear axles are connected by these longitudinals that I'm showing with the mouse called perch rods. And in this case, there are three of them. So when the buggy goes over, uh, say, a one-wheel bump, the perch rods have to twist. This, uh, this sub-chassis, if you like, has to actually twist to adopt to, to those different bumps. And if we look here from underneath, oh, there's Peggy off to one side. I became quite fond of Peggy. There, these are these longitudinal rods here. All right, so it's a bit more sophisticated than we might first have thought. How did it actually perform? Well, firstly, any damping of the suspension movement is done entirely by interleaf friction of the leaf springs. As they slide past each other, it's a type of frictional damping. But what about the natural frequencies, the softness or hardness of the suspension in different modes? Let's look here, firstly, at when one person was sitting in that front seat. The front natural frequency, the frequency at which the front suspension wanted to bounce up and down was two hertz. 
so not that incredibly soft. Two hertz would be a sporting car of today. The rear natural frequency was stiffer because that extra spring came into uh, operation, that extra transverse spring. Now, with one person sitting in the front seat, there was basically no load at the back, and so it had a higher natural frequency. If we'd put two people in the back, the natural frequency would have dropped again. Again, very, very tricky. The roll natural frequency, extremely low, 1.2 hertz. So in other words, you were never going to have stiff or, or stiff springing or fast roll accelerations with that very low frequency of roll acceleration. Now, normally the buggy would be carrying two people, if not more, and of course, as you'd expect, the natural frequency therefore drops. 1.8 hertz, front natural frequency, it drops because there's more spring deflection occurring. No change at the back because basically the, the rear, there's no rear load. If we put two people at the back and two people at the front, I think we'd probably be seeing 1.8 hertz front and back. And the roll natural frequency dropped just slightly. So those are all figures that if we looked at a modern car, we wouldn't be disconcerted by except maybe that one where we'd say, gee, we need a few bags of cement in the boot or something like that. That one is a little bit high, but that's because it wasn't carrying any load in the back. And remember, if you were loading stuff that you'd bought at market or were taking to market, that would probably go in the back. And so again, that would be dropping that natural frequency. Now, I was delighted to be taken for a ride. It, it was one of the most, I know it sounds mad, but it was one of the most exciting experiences riding in a car or a vehicle of any sort to assess ride quality. And there's a few things. Now, the, the buggy is in as it would have been used condition, all right? It's not been fully restored or anything like that. And the only thing that probably wasn't as it would have been once was the seat. Now, the seat was stuffed with horsehair and it had become, and it was a leather seat, and it had become quite stiff. And so it transmitted vibration. And the first thing I noticed as we were going around on these sorts of graveled surfaces is there was a bit of vibration transmitted through the seat from the iron tired uh, wheels going over the rough surface. So there was that vibration, which I don't think would have been very much present in the original buggy because the seat would have absorbed that really high frequency vibration, say 10 hertz or something like that. You probably would have been able to feel it through your feet, but I don't think you would have felt it through your seat. But what about over bumps? Well, here we can see we are uh, being taken by Peggy over a piece of timber lying across the ground, directly across. And when we went over that at a horse walking pace, yes, you could feel it, but only marginally, only just. It really was riding extremely well. On a rougher surface uh, with uh, Peggy, um, I don't know what the gate's called, at a trot, I suppose, uh, 15, 20 kilometers an hour, the ride really was outstanding. There were no sudden accelerations. There were no sudden jerks. There were no pitch accelerations, roll accelerations, vertical accelerations that were objectionable. The ride quality was really very, very good. In fact, uh, I was amazed. I was amazed at how good a ride quality could be achieved without pneumatic tires, without airfield tires. And as I say, over this bump, yeah, you could tell you'd gone over a bump, but there was no uh, um, uh, objectionable feeling. There was no, you know, oh, bang, we've hit a bump. It was just nothing like that. So um, when, I, when I talked to Carolyn about the performance, um, uh, she talked about uh, how they actually take that buggy out on dirt roads, local dirt roads. She talked about taking that buggy to a local town, which is about 25, 30 kilometres away, and said it was about a one-hour uh, one hour trip there and about a one-hour trip back, so averaging 25, 30 kilometres an hour. And I can imagine that, that the ride quality would have been absolutely fine. And, and, and certainly if the seat um, was restored to a soft, supple, original condition, I think the ride quality would have been exemplary. So it was just enormously uh, uh, eye-opening for me. I always had this feeling, you know, maybe these buggies aren't as primitive as they look. And uh, look, in terms of ride frequencies, in terms of, of pitch, and uh, roll frequencies, it was really very, very good. Now, it would have been developed by rule of thumb, it would have been developed by testing, um, but you know, the, the outcome I thought was quite exceptional. Uh, just amazing uh, ride the, in that machine. 
The book's called Car Suspension. That's the only buggy covered in the book. We go all the way up to uh, McLaren F1. We go up to current Porsche air suspension. And of course, we go all the way back through uh, some of the most amazing suspension systems that have been fitted to cars, hydroelastic uh, from BMC, uh, Packard's torsion level ride, um, Citroen's uh, both uh, interconnected suspension with a 2CV, but also uh, the, the DS19 hydraulics. We cover every interesting suspension that I could find in the book. It's out now, it's available from Amazon in your country. Thank you.